Um, I'm from a little different part of Iowa than Tim is, so uh, our soil definitely looks different, but I think I always try to stress to people Iowa is a big and diverse state, and, and we need to remember that it is. Um, I'm going to talk about why I chose strips. Start out with who I am and where I'm from. And like I said before, I'm from southwest Iowa. I think it's cattle country. Uh, our land is rolling land that tends to be highly erodible. Our CSRs are lower than some parts of the state, but we do have areas of very, very good land. Um, high crop prices have caused many people to believe that it's acceptable to clear the trees and farms this fragile ground. Pasture is becoming a rarity. In the neighborhood or region that I live in, soil loss is estimated at 10 to 20 tons per acre, and significant weather events are increasing. As far as our demographic, and I think sometimes one feeds the other, we have an aging population. We're dealing with declining enrollment in our public schools. We have an increasing number of public school students receiving free and reduced lunch. This number range ranges from 46 to 68 percent in the districts that we pay property taxes to. And Page County is currently the second highest per capita rate of cancer incidence in the state of Iowa. We've consistently stayed at the top, and uh, it's really not something to be proud of. This is Pinnock Farm. Um, the picture is of my, uh, my office. I'm, I'm blessed. I think one of the greatest pleasures in life is being able to work with your dog. And the other thing, um, and I'd probably encourage all of you to do this if you don't already, I took most of the photos in this presentation, and it's just because a few years ago I thought, wouldn't it be neat to take a picture every day of something on the farm? And through that process, uh, I actually gained a, an appreciation of how fortunate I am to make my career in agriculture. I'm, I'm lucky to have this be my vocation. Anyway, Pinnock Farm was founded in 1846 by my grandfather, James Shambaugh, my great-grandfather, James Shambaugh. Um, our pastures are located in Page, Taylor, and Adams counties. The whole operation is about 3,000 acres of owned, rented, and managed land, of which 2,400 acres are rotationally grazed pasture. There's about 400 acres of corn, wheat, and hay that we use for feed. Uh, 200 acres are set aside and land that's actually just set aside for uh, wildlife. And it's home right now to about 600 mama cows, but that number fluctuates depending on the weather. It's probably going to be down a little this year. Our revenue sources are from livestock production, outfitting, land mitigation, USDA subsidy payments. I think that it's best to be transparent and say I'm a farmer and I do get money from the government. Consulting and my wife's great job as an early childhood special education teacher. And stewardship is our number one priority. That's my daughter by a shallow water habitat we built. And about 15 years ago, we decided to make that our priority in our decisions. And what I found out is that by making that the basis for my decisions, everything else has fallen into place. What are my stewardship goals? Leave it better than you found it. Number two, do no harm, not people, not the land. Soil from Pinhook Farm stays on Pinhook Farm, and only safe and clean water walks, not runs, off of Pinhook Farm. So how do I achieve these goals? Well, there's the tried and true. You've got to have an open mind. You've got to maintain minimal debt. No-till, tile, and tariffs. But sometimes these practices alone are not enough. Here are a few other practices that help me in achieving my goals. We started using cover crops, and we do use photo points to monitor grazing areas. Riparian buffers and shallow water habitats. We build lots of ponds. We use late, se late season calving to conserve feed and fossil fuel. We use rotational grazing, and this is one of the areas I've started to learn that you really can do more with less. We do prairie restoration and have started to work on establishing colony habitat. And now we're trying stress. Why do I do all of this? Because protecting soil and water is good for my business, good for my family, good for my community and it's good for Iowa. And I really love water. Over the past three or four years, I've become a U.S. Coast Guard certified sailboat captain, and that is my other passion. So, now you know where I live, how I try to farm, and what I care about. The following slides are going to show you what high demand for row crops is doing to the land and water that I love so much. All these slides were taken on farms, not our own farms, but farms bordering our pastures. That soil is not becoming more productive. That's not sustainable. And this is not going to feed 9 billion people by 2050. But what's really sad is not only are Iowans being hurt by these practices, 
We're allowing this sediment to run right down the Mississippi and destroy the businesses of the people who rely on the Gulf for their living. We are Iowans and we can all be better. So how do we go from this to this? He plans some trips, piece cake, but that's the easy part. Convincing others is another story. These are real comments from really good people. They're from my neighbors, my friends, people I care about and people I grew up with. The first one they always say, well, what's the big deal about nitrogen anyway? Our water's fine. And if I go through these, I'll try to give some answers at the end. Then there's the finger pointing. Um, sometimes in the industry, they call it talking points. I call it the don't criticize your, the farmer with your mouth full of food response. And Tim touched on this too. You know, cities have runoff issues as well, and we've all learned that. I remember the 80s also, and this one's a tough one. I've got a mortgage to pay and a family to feed. Those deer eat my corn, kill them all and get rid of their habitat. Those waterways are your best land. Pile that out and you can farm it all. Cheaper to clear more land than to buy more. Plus, I can get funding to do it. And it takes a terrace to stop soil erosion. Now you've heard the comments. How about a few thoughts and answers? And let's start with the big one. What's the big deal about nitrogen? Well, there's a picture of my kids when they're little in my office. And here's a big deal about nitrogen. Infants below the age of six months who drink water containing nitrogen in excess of 10 milligrams per liter could become seriously ill and if untreated, may die. Symptoms include shortness of breath and blue baby syndrome. Here are the facts about nutrient runoff. Water going into the Des Moines Water Works has hit nitrogen levels as high as 24.39 milligrams per liter. Nitrogen levels above 10 milligrams per liter are not acceptable. Our runoff is a cause of hypoxia. Hypoxia is destroying the Gulf both environmentally and economically. This is not about my fear of regulation. This is about something that I don't want on my conscience. Okay, the finger pointing and the talking points. I'm just going to beat them to it. This is true. Cities do have huge runoff issues. Golf courses, Walmart, in my understanding, sells more nitrogen for yards than anyone in the world. And Tim touched on this earlier, too. But here's my answer. That's true. However, nitrogen and phosphorus leave my farm as well. Instead of pointing fingers, I'm going to do my part to fix a problem on my own farm. And for the record, many of our city cousins are doing some pretty cool stuff when it comes to managing stormwater. And finally, like Paul Harvey always said, self-government won't work without self-discipline. I've got a mortgage to pay. You know my answer? We should have learned by now, sick soil won't pay mortgages. How about farming those waterways? They're your best land, right? But you know, that was your best land until you got a five-inch rain. It's not anymore. Now here's a thought. What if we had more real waterways full of pheasants and quail? I still remember filling our cafes and motels every, every pheasant season, and that was good for commerce. Does anyone really want to sell out their hometown for two more rows? About the deer. Those deer eat my corn, destroy their habitat. Here's a good example. On our farm, that's what we would call a $10,000 deer on a 52 CSR farm. Which one do you think creates the greatest opportunities for rural economic growth and tourism? And I know one thing for sure, we've never filled our local cafes and motels for corn season. <laughs> this one comes up a lot, and you know what, sometimes it is true. It's cheaper to clear land than to buy more, but there's some land that wasn't meant to be farmed. And then a the terrace. Is a terrace the only way to control soil erosion? You know, we use them in places, there's nothing wrong with them, and they're effective. However, they cannot reduce nutrient runoff and strips can. I also think some land is too steep for strips, and I call that land pasture. So what can strips do? Got my dog in again. Well, here's what's been First of all, on sediment loss and runoff from 2008 to 2011, research done at the Neil Smith Prairie, the data shows a 95% reduction in sediment water from watersheds with prairie filter strips. Total nitrogen loss and runoff from 2007 to 2011. This is kind of like having you hugged the shrimp today. 90% reduction in total nitrogen export from watersheds with prairie filter strips. That means we're keeping a valuable nutrient in Iowa where we can make a better living. And this shrimp boat captain's got a chance to make a better living as well. That's the definition of a win-win. How about phosphorus runoff? 
90% reduction in total phosphorus export from watersheds with prairie forest strips. Effect on habitat, plant diversity is increasing where the strips have been established. This is from Anna McDonald. Uh, bird population diversity is increasing where the strips have been established. And what do Iowans who fund our programs and 60% of our federal crop insurance want? And as a farmer, I represent less than 2% of the population. So what the other 98% is concerned about really matters to me. The general public's top 10 priorities for ag policies and programs. Number one, clean drinking water. Number two, water quality for aquatic life. Three, rural job opportunities. Number four, flood control. Five, water quality for recreation. Six, game wildlife habitat. Seven, reducing greenhouse gases. Number eight, tourism opportunities. Number nine, crop production. And number 10, non-game wildlife habitat, which I love the birds. I think they're wonderful in the outfitting business. We know the, under the reason 10 is last is because bird watchers are cute, cute, cute. <laughs> And what the strips provide? Clean water, jobs from recreation, installation, and tourism. They slow water down. Habitat for birds, bees, and beasts. They sequester carbon. They create tourism through hunting, clean lakes, and streams. And they improve crop production by protecting our soil. And strips address what really matters, which is being able to say I left it better than I found it. Thank you all for your commitment to protect Iowa soil and water. You know, your local NRCS can help you plan it. One of the things the team talks a lot about, and it's taken me a little bit to understand, is it's sometimes the percentage of the field you put in. Now, we've done both. We've got a field that we put in on the contour, laid contour strips, and they range from 30 to 45 feet wide. Uh, one thing that I started looking at on another farm we're considering is we looked at the soil maps. And I talked about this earlier. Sometimes, you know, we use a, we look at a farm and say we give the average CSR for the farm. And I think that's something we need to start to work away from because, like on this farm in Taylor County, it's 160 acres, and the average CSR is 60. So people say, well, that's a 60 CSR farm, farm at all. Well, what it really is is 160 acres with 12 different soil types with a CSR range of 15 to 87. So what I'm doing on this farm, and I'm hoping we have a farm bill. My, my plan is to actually go in on those poorer soil types and simply incorporate them into the native grass. And then if we have to tweak it a little for soil runoff or anything, we will. But when we start to look at the soil maps, that really seems to be a logical way to follow, put that poorer soil into the, into the strips. And when you look at the slope and some of those things, I think that's going to address the, solve the problem. There's still some areas probably along the waters, you know, the creeks and the areas themselves that we'll have to put in that are better CSRs but should be in strips anyway or, or in something to filter the nitrogen. And the other thing we're learning about, you know, the way water moves, uh, the waterways themselves might be better in a smoother grass that actually lies down and lets the water move over it versus a strip with a lignin and, and that, that uh, kind of serves a different purpose, for lack of better words. So my advice would probably be to talk to your NRCS department and and get their help, but the other thing I really stress, especially where we live, really go back and look at that soil map. I mean, I'm as guilty as anyone. We, we learn these things when we're kids, and then we kind of forget about them. And uh, it, the light bulbs really start going off when you, when you see it. Uh, you start, no, get yours. Uh, I sat in on the workshop by uh, Mr. Brown yesterday, and I heard David Branch, and they're talking about diversifying cover crops next to Eight to ten species, maybe more, of cover crops, along with no-till systems, and uh, they're not using any fertilizers, pesticides uh, in their operations, and they're getting better yields uh, than anybody in this county. 
How long is it going to take Iowa to go to those systems? You've been farming longer than I have. <laughs> um, I don't. I don't. Have, I don't know. You know. I, I think. I, I guess my only answer to that is tenacity on my part, and and and, and all of us here. This has been a fun group to see, and it's kind of it's been really refresh, refreshing for me. But uh, this is a pretty small population. I, I think what I find out that always encourages me and surprises me. Um, there's a lot of people that really appreciate what we do. Um, a lot of them don't farm. Maybe they're the one that's one generation off the farm or two generations off the farm that remember how they were taught and, and how they learned agriculture. You know, we lost a lot of talent in the 80s. That's one of the sad things we, farm, we face, and, and I think farming's learned generationally. And, uh, but I, I, I can't answer that. Well, the point I'm trying to make is that they seem to have developed a system that is working to keep all these things in place. And I can nutrients on the soil, but also the soil itself. And they're still making money, producing. And uh, and it seems like what you're doing is really great. I mean, I don't want to migrate this, but it seems like this is a transition part. And I'm just wondering what you two have thought about going to that next level. Is it is it impossible in, in Iowa with our soil? To, to actually go to that, I guess for me, um, no, I don't think it's impossible. Uh, for me, the, the focus would be to actually want to become more of a row crop farmer, which isn't my passion. It'd be probably to find a young person that wanted to be involved in the operation and, and take that, that task on. Um, and uh, applying that, you know, and, and I have to admit, I found what I like focusing on, to be honest, is the cow herd and the hunting business. Um, my passion isn't so much in the crops, but I want to make sure it's done right. And I think that's where the enthusiasm and the passion for what you do, I mean, that's probably more about finding the right people than it is about um, anything else. And, you know, I've got a young man that helps now that likes farming, and if he's still around in another year or two and really seems committed, we'll probably test the waters with him. But as far as for right now, what our what our goal is is, is kind of uh, maybe to stop what I've seen going on. You know, if you're digging a hole, quit digging, mm -hmm. and to stop it, and then start to turn the turn the tide. Probably didn't answer your question very well, but it, it's a good point and it's true. Um, yeah. 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 The, the, the teams here, um, I, we haven't been at it long enough. I, I have seen, at least at Neil Smith, I've seen some ridging on the top side of the, of the strips. Um, I've seen on a different farm that we didn't call them strips, it was just there. I've seen some issues on the waterways where we're actually starting to make a new ditch in front of it that we're trying to address, so we don't know quite what to say about that. This is where I think strips alone don't solve the problem. You gotta have strips and cover crops and no-till and you know you gotta have a whole toolkit. Um, the idea of moving something that takes me four or five years to establish I'm not very excited about yet. So but the you know everything everything in nature is give and take. Um, it's also hard to find another crop that's gonna put a root system down five or six feet and give me that kind of a uh, diversity both above and below the ground for, for uh, ecological diversity, you know, for the predators, organisms, all that. But we'll see. It's a work in progress on that end. You were getting me in question. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's okay. Well, uh, you don't move any soil. Uh, you mean, how much, as far as establishing, you mean how much are we taking out of production? Oh, it's, it's not a, I'm sorry, it's not, it's an alternative to a terrace. And, and what it is, a, a terrace slows water down by the structure itself, stages it and slows the water down the strip 
slows the water down because the native grass has so much lignin in the stalks. It, it covers the ground, and when the water hits that, it does two things. You know, we have to remember water mo moves below the ground, and it moves above the ground. Well, when they first tried it, they tried it with grasses that had shallower roots, you know, years ago before this team got a hold of it. And I think that water ran right through. They use brome grass a lot. And what happened is the water ran right under the roots, and, and the brome grass folded over and ran right over it. So it was a, one of those, it was kind of the right idea, just not the right application. And now what this team's come in and figured out is that with the strips themselves, there's so much lignin in native grass stalks that that slows down sediment and water when it hits them. And the, the roots below actually sequester water and nutrients as it runs underneath the ground. And uh, you don't have to have the terrace structure. So, you know, I don't, I'm not here to be an advocate for big equipment because I don't think we'll feed 9 billion people with 24 row equipment. However, it's a lot nicer to move through a farm field with a grain cart or a planter when they're in strips than when you've got terraces to move around. It's not for everywhere, but it's a good alternative in a lot of places. It, I'm sorry, it, it's the, yeah. I, I kind of wondered if I should have gone more into that. I know that Matt Helmers talked yesterday about it, so I made the mistake of assuming. But what it, it's scientific trials of row tr crops integrated with prairie. And the concept is to increase diversity and protect uh, soil and water quality is to integrate within your farm fields pieces of native prairie. And uh, so that, that's what the, it stands for. Kind of depends on topography, soil type, watershed, all those different things. So that's where it's really best involved in NRCS. Um, you know, I, uh, for us, uh, on what I call more marginal land, I think I have a greater potential to make an income off that acre from recreation than I do from crop production. So for me, I'm going to go a little bigger. Uh, if I had a different priority for my farm, I'd want to establish a different concept, maybe more row crop acres or more hay acres or more alternative crop acres and less land dedicated to, to what I do. You know, it, it's to each person's choice in that regard. Well, after this year, I don't feel like I'm managing them very well, but... Um, it, it's been a wet, what we're doing is on our farm right now. This was the first year we established the test plot was last June, and uh, the cows love them. Uh, when it's been really cold, they're out grazing in, in one of the fields we first put them in, and you've got this stuff, you know, five six feet tall. And when it's below zero and cold, there's nothing like laying down in that bed of strips and you know being protected. Uh, one of the good things about ethanol is the byproducts, and you give them enough distillers to go with a low quality winter feed like that and it's actually pretty good quality if you harvest in the summer but uh, it's not a bad it's not a bad diet um, so far it seems to be a nice relationship I'm I'm trying to figure out the best way to manage it for for wildlife habitat you know we were kind of talking about this maybe we should wait to kick our cows out on the cover crops and the strips until first season deer uh, first shotgun season's over but just that's for me. I don't know that that's best, but on the other hand, we also saw pretty good growth in our cover crops, and to a certain degree, that might not have been a bad option. Our, our, we've used turnips and radishes with ours, and they really hit that peak about, you know, you saw that slide of, that was December 2nd on the photo point, and they really seemed to hit a peak production at that point, and that's when the cows need the energy to get ready for winter. So we're trying to figure out the best time to kick them out for winter grazing, but, you know, I wasn't able to go to Gabe Brown's meeting yesterday, and I wish I could have. Is there uh, paying trips? Can you do that? Yeah. Well, is there a need to do that? I mean, I think what we've seen with, with any kind of native prairie grass or native is that it needs to be hayed or burned periodically. Um, Maybe I ought to go back. Yeah. And what species are Oh my gosh, the, the more diversity the better. The one I used is what the NRCS calls a CP25 mix. So it's, I think, seven or eight different native grasses plus a variety of forbs. Um, if you want to hay up, if, we're, if you're going to go through the CRP, and someone needs to correct me if I'm wrong, I think you need to use a CP2 
mix because I think the CP25 is actually off limits for grazing and haying, but you can use the CP2 mix, which is pretty doggone close, and uh, you can come in and then you have the grazing option and the haying option as well. Have either one of you uh, incorporated the CSP program? I've used them. You've used it? Is it, is it going to be uh, beneficial through that CSP program? Um, for our bundle, it wasn't part of it, but I see it as being a benefit to us. I don't know. I just I signed up this uh, month ago, but I haven't been involved with it up to this point. And, that, and there's a variety, you, you know, within what you do. I think a lot of guys we talked about uh, CSP was kind of the gateway to cover crops that I've talked to, and, and liked it for that reason to get started. Uh, Talking about like mitigation of, of water quality. Yeah. I, I've never I've never heard of it. I guess the only thing that comes to my mind is once again, you know, the there literally is the there literally I mean, there's literal health concerns that can't be with with the nitrogen issue that I don't know that you could mitigate. I'm not sure. That'd be my. What, what, what he commented on is, is if you go to the USDA website on, in the, within the CSP program, um, they show the new enhancements, and that's the way the CSP, if you're not familiar with the CSP, it's all different conservation enhancements. And, yeah, and conservation stewardship program, and it's based off several different enhancements that you can do your property. Uh, and if you go to this website, it'll show the, the latest edition, which do include, you know, there's, like you said, cover crops, nitrogen monitoring, some of those areas. Mm -hmm. 